Welcome to the 18th lecture of ECE 113. This is the last lecture for ECE 113. And in this lecture, we will be talking about oscillators. So, important parameters to consider when designing oscillators are the following. It's tuning range. Basically, what is the frequency? Sorry, let's, let's make that red. So, what will be the frequency band of its operation? Is it large? Should, can, can it operate from, uh, say, 1 megahertz to 1 gigahertz and so on and so forth? Depends on your application, of course. The frequency stability. Basically, if the temperature changes, should the, does the frequency of oscillation also change? Phase noise and harmonics quantifies how clean the output spectrum of your oscillator is. Ideally, the frequency spectrum of an oscillator is an impulse function okay, by the carrier frequency, Fc, or its frequency of oscillation. Okay. Ideally, we want an impulse function, but in reality, well, you can't really make an impulse function. So a part of the frequency leaks out to its immediate vicinity, and that is due to the phase noise and the harmonics of your carrier. So uh, what devices can we use for oscillators? We can use transistors or diodes. Transistors allow for more control and compatibility. It's easy to design. Diodes are capable of higher frequency and power outputs due to its simpler uh, design. So transistors, they have complicated arrangements of PNP. So for example, a PNP transistor or a, or a JFET where you have an N-type body and a P-type uh, coating right here. So uh, just for JFET and this is your uh, BJT, right? Okay. Uh, diodes are simpler because the geometry and the device is, well, it's easier to predict. Okay. It uses less semiconductor devices. See, so that's just an example, and you can use that for higher frequency due to it being smaller and can handle a larger power output. So, how does an oscillator operate? An oscillator converts your DC input to an AC waveform. Basically, if you just power your oscillator up, so let's say this is your oscillator, you just co you just connect some DC voltage, and the output should be sinusoidal and it follows the Nyquist or Barkhausen criterion for instability. So how does that work again? Well, you have a control system right here, your loop, uh, your forward open loop gain, gain A and you have a feedback gain F that says it's being sub subtracted for negative feedback. Okay, So the Let's say this is V out and this is VI. The transfer function of this system is equal to A over 1 minus AF. And it will become unstable if, oops, will become unstable if AF is equal to 1. We want that. Okay, we want that to happen in our oscillator. So should AF be equal to one, then our uh, circuit will definitely oscillate. So how to do that? To do that, you need what we call a negative resistance. Let me consider this function right here, where you have a uh, negative resistance on the other side. So how did it become negative? Well, recall that for a resistor, the current flows this way, and you have a voltage that is a result of a current flow. If this resistance exhibits a different exhibits a behavior like this, then its resistance is negative because the current is flowing from the negative to the positive side. And that's the characteristic of voltage sources. 
So basically, our negative resistance device is a form of a source voltage, which can be achieved using active devices. So that would mean that this Xn and Rn will be a function of the bias current and the frequency of operation. Okay. So by KVL, using that circuit, this is your uh, equation. And when will this uh, KVL be equal to zero? Then that means your RL plus Rn should be zero and your XL plus Xn should be zero. Since we're looking at the passive load, then RL will be greater than zero. Thus, we need Rn to be less than zero, a negative resistance. So it must be an energy source. This equation right here controls the frequency of oscillation since the reactive devices are mostly are frequency dependent. Okay. So a stable oscillation will occur using Kurokawa's condition right here. So the reactive devices change in frequency multiplied by the change of your Rn with respect to I should be great should be greater than this right here. Basically, you just need a high Q circuit. A high Q circuit recall creates very large selectivity. For example, this is your F naught right here. A high Q circuit would have a response that looks like this. Okay. And we can approximate it if it's very high, we can approximate it as a delta function. So that's the use of high Q circuits. Okay. And that is a maximum oscillator stability. And those devices are cavity and dielectric resonators. But well, let's just leave that for advanced electronics. So a transistor oscillator works this way. Let's say you want to supply a load with a certain oscillation. All right. So this is your RF output. Okay. So it could be this one, but uh, let's say it's this one since we're talking about the load. So recall that gamma n is a function of gamma l, which is right here, and gamma out is a function of gamma s right here. A transistor oscillator uh, can be uh, needs to what do you call this? Transistor oscillation, okay, uh, oscillation and transistor will happen if your gamma s and gamma l and gamma n and gamma out uh, satisfies these conditions. So this is a condition when your device is marginally stable that means in the s plane you have poles on the j omega axis so this condition satisfies this okay and uh, how do you do that sorry how do you do that? If you look at this circuit right here, it kind of looks like that, such that if your Z in is equal to negative Z L, or sorry, there you go, Z L is negative Z in, then it follows that gamma in multiplied to gamma L is equal to one. So your gamma in is a reflection coefficient that is greater than or equal to 1 depending on your gamma L right here so you need to find the condition gamma in and gamma out to be greater than 1 so we want the transistor to operate in an unstable region such that there you go you get these two to be equal to 1 okay so now let's look at the phase noise. It refers to the short term random fluctuation of noise in the phase or in frequency. And because of that, 
it introduces uncertainty during the signal detection. So the Kurokawa's condition, because of noise, your current right here can change a lot. Well, not a lot, even a little. So your current can change a little, which could change R in and X in, which would uh, compromise the stability of your oscillation. So because of phase noise, you get unwanted generation of signals during mixing. It limits your selectivity, sensitivity, and produces interference. Okay. So it looks like this. We want an impulse function delta of f minus f naught, but because of noise fluctuation, then the energy spreads in, a, in the vicinity of your frequency spectrum. Okay. And also, there are spurious signals here that pertains to some uh, harmonics. Okay. So aside from the random fluctuations of the frequency, you get a fluctuation or noise due to, well, due to different effects inside your active devices. Okay. So the output voltage of an oscillator can be quantified by this equation. You have some amplitude function that fluctuates with time and theta of t phase that fluctuates also with time. So this can be discrete and random in nature. And recall that this equation right here is a form of phase modulation or angle modulation, which directly correlates to frequency modulated signal. So this phase modulation and frequency modulation are actually inter interchangeable. So your phase variation is actually indistinguishable from a variation in frequency. That's why we have a spreading of our oscillated sig oscillation signal. Okay? So what that does is it could degrade the selectivity of a receiver. For example, you have a desired signal here and some interpreter. When you down convert that, the interpreter will become closer to your desired signal because of this spreading of your oscillation. So the requirement for phase noise then, so how much phase noise should your oscillator have depends on the desired signal, the selectivity that you want, the power of the interpreter, and the bandwidth. Let's have an example for that. Let's say you have a GSM cellular telephone requires a minimum of 9 dB rejection. So this ensures that you will be able to communicate even if there's interference from an adjacent user. So this adjacent user can be placed at different parts away from you. And at 3 MHz, you have a user interference of negative 23. At 1.6 MHz, user interference at negative 33 dBm. 0 0.6 MHz away from you. Your user uh, interference level is negative 43. And you, what the signal that you receive is negative 99 dBm. Let's say the bandwidth is 200 kHz, standard for GSM. What should be the uh, phase noise? So the phase noise uh, denoted by this fancy L. Okay, the phase noise is equal to the carrier. Let's say at three at three megahertz. Depends on the carrier power, the selectivity right here. So carrier selectivity, and at three megahertz. The signal is negative 23, so minus negative 23 right here, minus 10 times logarithm of the bandwidth. Okay. And if you plug this in your calculator, it will result into negative 118. Sorry. It will result into 100 negative 118 dBm. Sorry not dBm. The unit of phase noise is actually decibel carrier per hertz. Okay, so for the other results, you get these values. Okay. Oops, should be negative 138. Okay, so there you go. 
So as you can see, your face noise is low. It's very low. Okay? And this cannot be achieved by just an oscillating transistor. Okay? So the result of this can be an oscillation, but it's not that stable yet. So it's very noisy, basically. We use a phase lock loop to create a more stable oscillation. Okay, so what does a phase lock loop do? Consider this setup right here, where you have a voltage controlled oscillation. Okay, so as you know, the uh, the reactive components can be controlled okay, using a voltage, for example, your diode. Okay. If you have a diode with a certain biasing, okay, you have a biasing voltage here. So this diode can become a capacitance depending on the voltage your capacitor changes. So this is a varactor. By using that, okay, let's say there is some mechanism, say a person, that looks at the output of A and tries to lock the output of A in the same phase so that the output of this will become in phase with channel A. And this is channel A connected is your reference oscillator. So what this mechanism does, let's say a person, is it's trying to synchronize this voltage controlled oscillator to a reference oscillator. Okay? So this reference oscillator can be very noisy, okay? And the output here from the VCO can be stable and clean, okay? So what can the person do? It should just adjust this VCO until your channel A and channel B agrees with each other or make clock B run faster and then reset the frequency until it catches up with clock A. So the phase locking is used to generate a stable signal from an unstable or noisy reference signal. So we use a very noisy transistor setup or a diode setup or maybe even a crystal oscillator. So crystal oscillator. So it's a noisy oscillation, okay, but when we uh, use a phase lock loop, we can generate stable and clean oscillating signals. In effect, your PLL acts as a narrowband filter. So instead of having a phase noise that looks like this, if you filter that out, maybe it will become narrower. Okay, So it looks like your phase, loop, phase locking actually looks like a carrier recovery algorithm. Okay, So this is an example of a phase lock loop. So you have a reference input, you mix that with the output of the VCO, okay? and you have the phase error right here. The phase error will be filtered out by a narrow band loop filter, okay? and this will become, the output here will become a DC voltage that controls the oscillation of the VCO, which adjusts the frequency of this. So until this becomes coherent with this, your PLL output will be, will be unstable. Once your VCO is now coherent to your reference, then the PLL output stabilizes. So this is an example of a control system. Okay. So the loop filter uses op amps to produce a weighted sum of the phase detector. So the uh, loop filter here is equal to its uh, impulse response or sorry its transfer function rather is equal to this oops there you go so what this does is actually it it's an integrator sorry this this is, there you go. This is the output 
uh, the transfer function of this circuit. And this is an integrator. Right? It integrates this output. So if you have a sinusoidal output, the, the input rather, if it's sinusoidal, then the output would be a DC voltage. Right? So depending on the bandwidth of the filter, depending on the bandwidth is the response time. Okay. So if you have a larger response time, you have a lower bandwidth. And if you want your response to be faster, you need to increase the bandwidth. And increasing the bandwidth would mean that your output will actually it won't be DC, it will have some fluctuations. Okay? And it grows larger as you increase the bandwidth. Okay? So some design consideration and trade-offs is the frequency range of operation, the acquisition time, and the tracking accuracy in high loop gain. Okay? So different types of frequency synthesizers. So a frequency synthesizer, instead of using a phase lock loop, the phase lock loop ensures stable oscillation. Now to achieve higher frequencies, we need to use synthesizers. Okay? So a signal generator, which can be switched to put out any one of discrete set of frequencies and whose frequency stability is derived from a standard oscillator. So let's say you have a reference oscillator that is not clean, so it's very noisy. Okay. Once you pass that through a, to, through a PLL, then you get a stable oscillator with a certain frequency. So that is now used in a frequency synthesizer which could uh, increase the frequency by a fraction, or not a fraction, some uh, rational multiple of F0. Okay? Well, not really, not rational multiple, just multiple of F0. So your frequency synthesizer makes sure of, or generates higher frequencies of oscillation. And there are different techniques to do that. We have the direct synthesizers, which uses multipliers, dividers, and mixers for you to be able to create a large or synthesize a large range of frequencies. Indirect synthesizers, which uses again phase lock loops for uh, for a frequency uh, of oscillation for higher frequencies. There you go, and stable higher frequencies since we're using phase lock loops and direct digital synthesizers, which uses a digital accumulator to produce a staircase sawtooth and then a staircase sinusoid, finally. And that will be converted. So this is your staircase sinusoid. Oops, sorry. Staircase sinusoid. And it will be converted by a DAC. It will become a, an analog sinusoid. So let's look at each and every one of them. Your direct synthesis. For example, if you want to produce 321 megahertz from a 1 megahertz. So in this case, we'll be using triplers. So by using three triplers, four rather successively, you can produce an 81 megahertz signal. If you mix that 81 megahertz with 3 megahertz, create a 78 megahertz signal depending on what you choose using this bandpass filter. And this 81 megahertz is again multiplied by 3 to produce 243 megahertz. And if you mix that, you get a 321 megahertz at the output. Okay, so uh, this is an example of a difficult implementation since 321 is only has two prime factors, right? and it's actually difficult to create this kind of multiplier. Okay. So instead of uh, having a multiplier of 107 with your times 1 megahertz, we use a, an indirect approach using different multipliers and mixers just to create a high frequency of 321 megahertz. Okay, so the designs are actually highly dependent on the ratio of the desired frequency and the reference frequency. So it's highly dependent on your oscillating uh, reference right here and how much frequency do you need so it's actually difficult to uh, make it to, to create it to be flexible okay 
to have a flexible direct synthesizer of to create higher frequencies. Uh, this diagram is used as a reference. Okay. So use mixers and dividers to create a higher a high frequency from several references. Right? So let's say you have a minimum of 20. Right? Depending on the switch position, you have some 20 plus N1 megahertz of frequency right here that will be mixed with this 20 megahertz here. And you add that, you get this one. Then you divide by 10 and you get this value right here. Right? And then you add 16 megahertz to that. You get this one, which will be mixed right here. And uh, from a set of reference frequencies, you get 20 plus N2 here, and you get an extension of the previous operation that you did. At the end, you get something like this. You will be able to set your frequency in such a way and in a higher resolution. Depending on how large your chain is, you can set the frequency up to right here, the thousandth digit. Sorry, not thousands. More, yeah, up to the thousands digit. Right. So we can uh, basically increase the resolution by getting more of these. Right. So this is your mix and divide direct synthesis, and switching between frequencies is actually very fast because you just need to switch your uh, reference oscillators on each. Uh, on each digit right here. Okay. Indirect synthesis can be done by using a control system. So this is used for a digitally tuned radio and television receivers where you don't really need to have a time sensitive element. Okay. So when you switch when you switch between frequencies you don't need it to be fast and you use a control system for your frequency to be very much stable okay so because of this because of slow switching this is not desire desirable for shortwave radio whose steps are 10 hertz okay? and the frequency steps of the of this architecture is large so the resolution of your indirect synthesizer is actually lower than what you see here where you can achieve a thousands of, of a digit resolution okay so what this does is basically the output if you have a one megahertz reference the output will be n over m times your one megahertz reference that will be the frequency at the output of this indirect synthesizer right so finally, you have a direct digital synthesizer. Basically, you just use DQ flip-flops for accumulation and for a read-only read memory for a digital wave conversion. So from your sawtooth to sign, and finally, you use a DAC for a digital to analog conversion. So from a digitally uh, produced waveform, you will be able to create an analog signal. For example, if you have a 100 MHz reference oscillator, the frequency resolution will be equal to this, depending on the number of bits. So you can achieve a frequency step of 0.023 Hz using a direct digital synthesizer or DDS. And actually how it, how it works is if you have a clock port right here, okay, and it's let's say you have bit one here so your output will change in this flip-flop your output will change at every clock cycle so if this is your clock cycle let's say uh, your your flip-flop reacts reacts to a uh, rising edge then let's say it starts with zero then at the first rising edge it sees it will switch to one Okay, so let's continue the cycle. The next rising edge here, it flips to zero. Next rising edge here flips to one. 
next rising edge here flips to zero as you can see the frequency of this let's say this f naught the frequency here at the bottom is f naught over two so that's how a direct digital synthesizer works okay so just to compare we want to compare the switching speeds phase continuity and phase noise of the different synthesizers your direct synthesizers can switch almost instantly as compared to your indirect where you need the loop to settle first so you need the PLL to settle first before you achieve the frequency that you need in terms of phase continuity this means that every time you switch your frequency do you uh, send out any spurious signals due to switching right? a direct synthesizer can only be obtained if the mixers and multipliers are only used and no dividers right? the indirect uh, synthesizer also has phase continuity but it takes some time to catch up for a direct digital synthesizer the main advantage of this is that there is no sudden phase jump and finally the phase noise is dependent on the filter bandwidth but in general you, every multiplier you add increases the noise by n squared dividers increases the noise by m squared so you have yeah, m dividers m squared multipliers n squared and so on and so forth Okay. So generally, they, they, they don't have any advantage in terms of phase noise. So what you look at uh, here is that for an indirect synthesizer, the main takeaway, it's a slow but stable uh, stable frequency. Okay. As compared to your direct and direct digital, it's fast but uh, may have a more unstable frequency. Okay. So that's the end of ECE 113. If you have any questions or comments, or if you need any clarifications, if there are some, there's something wrong with what I said in the slides, you can always leave a comment in the comment section below. I'll respond as soon as possible. Thank you for listening. See you next meeting.